Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books, out loud. This is a little blue book. It just happens to be little blue book number 678, and it is titled E. Haldeman Julius, The Man and His Work, written by John W. Gunn. And this was written, copyrighted 1924. This is part two, and we left off at the top of page 15, and that's where we'll begin. This capacious gusto of laughter in Haldeman Julius he appreciates humor of the most subtle and refined nature, and humor that is more or less obvious and irresistibly ridiculous. But whatever the order of humor, there must be in it something apt, picturesque, spontaneous, if it appeals to Hadelman Julius. The pointless and parallel bores him beyond utterance. Next to books, Humor has furnished the most powerful mutual attraction in my friendship with Hadelman Julius. Not a discreet, decorous, merely smiling wit, although this has its place, but an immense and impetuous humor, a thing of mighty and prolonged laughter, the humor that envelops the whole man and shakes him to, in a very gale of cockination, the most profound and fearful quaking of the rise abilities. It is the kind of laughter that leaves one weak, and that is a most excellent tonic for a wayward digestion. Sober citizens, seeing Hadelman Julius thus convulsed, might lose confidence in him. Can a man who will throw dignity to the winds and laugh with such utter abandon possibly be as sound and serious as he should be? Therein the sober citizens would be wrong, for there is in laughter the true stuff of wisdom, protecting one from the errors and absurdities of life. One who has so keen and heartily a sense of the absurd is not apt to be himself absurd. And such a one is in touch with the larger elements of human nature. I believe the man of humor is the more acute thinker, the better reasoner, the more acute observer of life. The essence of humor is incongruity, and a sense of humor is the faculty largely initi initiative of perceiving the discords and disproportions, the irrelevancies and inconsistencies of things. Humor is, indeed, akin to logic. And it is never quicker than in exposing logic itself, when the latter goes astray, forcing itself into false attitudes, it is significant that the haters of sham have been men of humor. To see things as they are, to coordinate one's impressions, to go instantly to the point of a question, these are the characteristics of a mind given to humor. This, I know, is true of Hadelman Julius. His humor is part and parcel of his admirably sane and direct mind. No circumlocations, no beating about the bush, no befoolment, and befuddlement by spacious phrases or generalities. Nothing of this will, f will you find in Hadelman Julius. He is a realist. He insists that he has ideas rather than ideals. And he will, if necessary, take considerable pains to get at the truth of a question rather than easily succumb to any notion, however plausible or popular. He has, however, the fortunate trait of being able to see quickly the weakness of an argument of viewing in a moment of swift, searching thought the essential features of any issue or viewpoint of life. And reaching a sound conclusion, I think of what P. G. Patmore said of Hazlitt. A practical musician can play anything at sight, as the phrase is, but Hazlitt could perceive and describe at sight the characteristics of anything, without any previous study or knowledge whatever, but by a species of intellectual intu intuition. Other men become acquainted with things progressively, and with more or less quickness and precision according to their capacity and to the attention they bestow. But Hazlitt felt them at once. They did not gradually engrave themselves upon his perceptive faculties, but struck into them at once as by a single blow. This, I should say, is very true of Hadelman Julius. He has, too, a gift of happy phrase, of compressing a great deal into a brief illuminating sentence. He is, when the mood is upon him, a first-rate talker. 
His talk is real talk, spontaneous, vigorous, a freely flowing thing, interspersed with anecdotes and allusions, and full of the common, lively speech of every day. And it has that unforced literary quality, which is to be observed in the conversation of very intelligent persons. Or is it the other way about? And is literature more alive and attractive when it rivals the direct, intimate style of good talk? But while Hadelman Julius can talk, and talk exceedingly well, I should not call him strictly a talker. When you have been with him day, day after day, you reflect that the sum of his talk is not large. His talk, perhaps less than the ordinary person, and unlike the ordinary person, he is not voluble about trifles. He has the divine gift. I suppose it is a divine gift, as it does not appear to be a general faculty of human nature. Of silence. He doesn't feel that to be companionable, he must toss out words, make talk, regardless of the occasion. I have spent several hours in his company without half a dozen words passing between us. We have driven mile after mile along the country roads around Gerard, each wrapped in his own thoughts. On the other hand, I have seen Hadelman Julius animated and delightfully communicative during a long evening of talk. His talk has a wide range through the world of books, ideas, people, and he can see the extraordinary under the surface of the seemingly ordinary. He seldom talks about people, and when he does, he ignores the trivialities of gossip and seeks for a genuine, perhaps humorous, touch of character. He is quick to see the odd things about people, their amusing fo foibles, and he has quite an air of friendliness in the presence of such people, out of gratitude, perhaps, for being amused. Once in the smoking room of, the, of a theater, Hadelman Julius, who had been only mildly entertained by the show, was heartily diverted by the na native, by the naive, boastful conversation. A monologue it was of a fellow who told how he had known beforehand the outcome of a certain automobile race, how he had offered to bet this one and that one large sums on the event, how he was privy to the peculiarities of each driver in each car and so on without drawing a breath listening all trace of bore of boredom dis listening all trace of boredom disappeared from Hadelman Julius's face it was a real show to him he was captivated by the naivete of all this bluster again i recall how a precise elderly gentleman in the course of an evening approached Hadelman Julius half a dozen times to inquire the exact facts of his business that is he would state what he assumed to be the facts, and asked if he was correct. It tickled Hadelman Julius's humor, thus to meet a man who, as he said, was a great stickler for facts, but could never get his facts straight. Then I remember a story he told me about an old-time socialist of an eastern city whose hobby was the need of a working model for socialism, or of whatever idea took strong hold of him, and at every meeting this good practical soul would reiterate earnestly Comrades, we must have a working model. There is something deeper than human, a blending of sympathy and satire in the story of a certain colored man with mosaic aspirations. I once thought of writing a little story about this man, said Hadelman Julius. He was a man who dwelt much upon the wrongs of his race. He had a gift of crude but impassioned utterance, and he often spoke before assemblages of the Negroes of the community. If he could only do something to deliver his race from oppression, this must have been the thought which was constantly with him. He often told me that what his brethren needed was a leader who would really lead them somewhere. He took the idea of leading literally. I think some out outrage against the Negroes in the South finally drove him to action. He had an idea. The thing to do was to lead the Negroes out of the country and into Mexico, where he thought, they would find free and humane treatment. He was an avid reader and had read something about the advanced social ideas of Mexico. So his plan was quite simply to start walking south and as he went along to gather about him the Negroes of each community and thus to inspire a general exodus of his race. It was a great dream, a really dramatic picture, and he could see the army growing larger as he went further south into eventually 
until eventually his race depopulated the South, which stand on the free soil of Mexico. But alas, this man's endurance was only human, if his vision was divine. He never got more than a dozen miles on his liberating march. He informed me sadly that he had to turn back because his feet hurt him, but I think he was sore at heart too, because his people had not responded as he had hoped to the vision he had brought them. I have said that Hadelman Julius is a realist, and he looks for the deep, authentic note of reality in literature. With the seeking after strange new forms, he is not so much impatient as, frankly, unsympathetic. We were talking of this one day, discussing a recent novel that was a truly astonishing dance in mid-air, or a grotesque striding on verbal stilts, or a prodigious writing in the bowels of chaos. But whatever one might call it, there was no clear, solid, genuine theme upon which one could place a finger of understanding. The author, said Hadelman Julius, might be seeking to astonish his readers by a strange, unearthly performance, or he might be seeking sincerely enough to hit upon a new means of communication with his fellows. At any rate, he continued, this seems to me a futile chasing after shadows. At best, and however sincere, it arises from a peculiar confusion of values. Apparently, there is a notion that form is somehow expressive by and of itself, that if one can find a new way of saying things, this will be equivalent to having new things to say. There are writers who have evidently forgotten the truth. It might really be called a truism, that thought, not form, is the important thing. Form, it is true, can lead grace or significance to thought and one may use familiar forms in a novel way, or perhaps employ a novel combination of old forms. For example, I have just been reading Upton Sinclair's Hell, in which he cleverly combines the older drama with the photo play. But Sinclair knows what he is trying to do, and there is no obscurity in the results. So has Sherwood Anderson put something new into the short story, notably in his Winesbury, Ohio, but one can't say that here is a new form, rather it is a new spirit. What is Anderson's best novel? Poor White. Poor White, a work in the South in the sound tradition of the English novel. Now Anderson is seeking after strange forms, and it is a sad lapse. Essentially, a realist, a man who can write only with his feet on the ground, he has lost himself in the clouds. I don't honestly believe that if a man has something to say, and a powerful urge to say it, he will waste much time finding a medium for his message. What he has to say will, in a fashion, say itself. Very likely he will seize the first form ready at hand, guided instinctively by the bent of his temperament and the nature of his theme. It appears to me that the novel has touched life at all possible points, that it contains all that is ca it is capable of, and that the seeking after new forms is an admission of the fact. Certainly the novel has exhausted its capabilities in the reproduction of visible life and the ordinary study of human nature. And now we have a novelist like James Joyce trying to give us the stream of consciousness, seeking to penetrate indeed to what is below consciousness, below action, and even thought, and to what resides in the subtle processes of the blood itself. On the other hand, the drama is still flexible and variously expressive. It's still finding new things to say about life, which it says clearly and confidently. Witness the plays of Eugene O'Neill, Capic, and Pirandello. Pirandello, the drama, it would seem, having visible forms at its command, can attempt things beyond written fiction, which relies solely upon words. Fiction has its role though I sometimes think it is a diminishing role, but it is a role that the, is fairly well established. One might accept the short story, just as a small body can be shifted more easily than a large body. So the short story has greater mobility than a novel. A short story may be a prism that reflects a subtle passing mood, a brief fantastic thing, but moods are fleeting and the novel is long. I would not give the impression that Hadelman Julius is fundamentally and antipathetic 
to fiction. He has indeed the very imaginative qualities, the generous emotions, the feeling of the stir and vastness of life, that are the best stuff of fiction. The truth, I think, is that Hadelman Julius has the sense of fatigue that comes to all really active minds after the reading of many novels. This world of fiction is a glorious art-created world, a world peopled with tremendous figures and full of fine sentiments, and it has a most quickening, expansive influence. But it cannot, alone and always, satisfy the mind. It never entirely loses its charm. One enters it again and again for a brief, thrilling glimpse. But more and more one seeks the solid, immediate contacts with life. Thus, Hadelman Julius prefers biography to fiction. There are so many real men and women that I long to know about, great figures of the past, significant figures of the present, that I find it increasingly difficult to interest myself in imaginary people, explains Hadelman Julius. There is an intimate note, an air of reality in biography that fiction can hardly attain. You will find, too, that the elements that appeal to you in fiction are also present in biography. Here you have color, conflict, character. Above all, you have character, as character is what appears to me most powerfully in fiction. And it is indeed the chief business of fiction to portray character. So in biography, I find this appeal in a greater degree. What character in a novel could be so real and so important as Dr. Johnson, as Boswell pictures him for us? What more amazing and tragic story can the novelist conjure out of his imagination than the story of Oscar Wilde, as it is supremely told by Frank Harris? What novel has ever pictured the contemporary human scene more vividly and minutely than Pepe's diary? I have, of course, no patience with those who dismiss the novel because they don't like imaginative writing. Imaginative writing is the greatest kind of writing. But I contend that biography and history, if they are written as they should be, belong in the class of imaginative writing. One can see real people and real events with the ver vivifying eye of the imagination. The biographer has the same task of making character real that confronts the novelist. Just as the novelist must do something more than merely give a bare record of events, so must the biographer achieve a far more difficult task than that of simply putting before his readers the chronological record of his subject's life. He must illuminate the facts with an accurate perception of character. He must have a proper sense of the fateful issue of life. He must get in all the fine shades as well as the bold outlines. Think what a staggering work of the imagination is Wells' outline of history. Wells pictures the history of mankind from the very dawn of life on this planet in all its pains and glory. The sweep of the ages is in his work. And do you think it did not require the very highest order of imagination to make all of this so real? Wells, as a novelist, has told a number of great stories, but the greatest story he has ever told is the story of the human race. Frank Harris has been mentioned. He is a living writer, and one who has never reached anything like popularity, although he has a considerable and ardent following. To me it is proof of the sane, clear, honest judgment of Hadelman Julius that he recognizes Harris's greatness and is on move by criticism of the man. If Harris had done nothing but write his master masterly biography of Oscar Wilde, his place in literature would be assured, declares Hadelman Julius. And I think we'll stop there at the top of page 25, and uh, we'll see you next time in part 3. Thanks for listening.